This tutorial about format is brought to you by one of the authors of Revising Professional Writing, now in its third edition. My students call me Dr. Kim. The publishers made this video available under a Creative Commons license. Click on the button for more information or to contact the publisher. Remember, you can use the pause button anytime. And if you see shadows or a green bar across the screen, adjust your playback quality settings. All right, the view you see here includes everything you might learn about professional writing in my tutorials. There are others that help you understand content development, organization, style, or mechanics, as well as the rhetorical context that determines which content, organization, or style will be effective in a specific situation. Even though our primary interest in this tutorial is the message itself, Effective format can be understood only by taking into account the writer's purpose and audience. If you haven't listened to the tutorials on rhetorical context yet, you should. All right, this tutorial focuses on one area of organization. We'll call it format. We're going to consider the format of a recommendation report sent to a client. The quality in the video makes it impossible for you to read the document. If you're a student using our book, your instructor can provide you with a copy, or you can visit my blog at Prose Write. This report, in which the page you see appears, was written by a technology consultant who was hired by the client, a commercial brewing company, to identify a device to protect the company's computer network. This page is from the report's glossary. I've revised the original somewhat for instructional purposes. The audience is made up of managers at the brewing company. They're certainly non-experts about the topic of the report, and they're also likely to be somewhat skeptical of or sensitive to the writer's message. That means the writer has to increase the reader's readiness to accept the report's content. In this tutorial, I hope to convince you that format matters in this report. My explicit aim, though, is to explain three areas of formatting you need to understand to create successful workplace documents. Very few professionals get any formal training in this area, although the vast majority now have the kind of formatting tools in their word processing or email programs that only typesetters had access to in the past. So my focus here is to introduce just a few simple guidelines. The first area of formatting you need to understand we'll call page layout. I'll mention three aspects of layout. That's white space, line spacing, and justification. And I'll demonstrate how they influence the efficiency with which readers get a written message. Take a minute, look at the passage from a page uh, of the recommendation report that I just showed you. It's not important that you actually read the passage. In fact, try to ignore the words and see the shape or arrangement of black text on a white background. Well, research shows that people would read the document with this passage more slowly with more mistakes than with the revised version I'm going to show you. So what about the layout was changed? Well, the first change in this revised version has to do with white space. There's more white space around each glossary entry. That allows the reader to locate the beginning of each entry more quickly. The second change also has to do with white space, specifically with using less white space between lines of prose or text. The original used double spacing, but the revised version uses single spacing. Amateurs often fail to notice that no one except a teacher wants to read a double-spaced document. I mean, have you read any double-spaced books lately? The third change has to do with justification. In the revised version, prose is justified or aligned only at the left margin, while it was fully justified in the original. That means at both left and right margins. 
Full justification stretches the space between words and characters, which usually results in less distinctive word shapes. And did you realize you read words by visual shape and only have to process individual characters when the word's unfamiliar? Or when someone has stretched the characters so that the shape is lost? All right, so when it comes to page layout, use white space to signal the different portions within your prose or text. Use single spacing, unless you're explicitly told otherwise by your reader. And use left justification only. There are other format changes in the revised document, so let's consider some of them. The second area of formatting you need to know something about is typography. There are people who make their living as typographers, so there is obviously much to know before you can become an expert. I'm not trying to make you an expert. I'm just going to mention three aspects of type that should be most useful to you as a professional who writes as part of your job. That'll be typeface, boldface, and italics. What you see here is one entry from the Recommendation Report's original glossary. Now, what I want you to do is compare the typography of the same entry in the revised version. So what's different? Well, the first change has to do with the typeface, commonly called font. The revised version uses a serif, S-E-R-I-F, typeface. It includes little feet on each letter. Let me explain. See how the R in RAM has little feet on it? That means it's a serif typeface. Now look at the R in the heading, revised. It has no feet, which means it's a sans serif typeface. Here's why you should care. Because people read lines of text in serif typeface more quickly. Sans serif should only be used for headings or titles. Sans serif is also good for reading on a screen because those fine lines that are used to create the feet on serif type make the characters kind of blurry when they're projected. So the second change in type in the revision is that the glossary term blackout appears in boldface. And that was an effective way to set it apart from the rest of the prose which defines that term. So, when writing a document with blocks of prose that will be printed, use a serif or footed typeface, like Times New Roman or Garamond. Use sans serif, like Arial, only for shorter things like headings. And use boldface or italics to distinguish among different terms. But make sure you use them consistently throughout your document. The third area of formatting you need to understand is the use of lists. I'm going to mention two aspects of lists. The characters used to identify items in a list and the difference between stacked and integrated lists. Take a moment to look at the passage from another page of the recommendation report. Does this passage include a series of items? I think it does. And how many items are there? I see four. These are the attributes the writer says should be included in the UPS. The revised version of this passage makes it easier for readers to see that there are four attributes because a character appears at the beginning of each item. I've inserted lowercase letters with parentheses, but there are certainly other possibilities. You could use a single parenthesis after each character. You could use numerals. You could use square brackets, etc. The revised version implements a list by integrating characters within the prose. The other possibility shown here is to create a stacked or vertical list in which each item begins on a new line. Often stacked lists use bullets, but other characters are possible as well. Like any type of list, bullet lists are only valuable if they present relatively short items that belong in a series. Using a bullet to introduce an entire paragraph of prose is not more efficient than using extra white space before and after the paragraph, and writing an entire document as a bullet list will not make your message more effective or efficient. 
Now it's time to check your understanding of format by revising a passage you haven't seen before. This comes from an executive summary in a different report. The specific question asks that you revise so that typography is used distinctively. Pause the recording if you need to. When you look at this, what you see is that boldface appears with four terms in the passage. So my question is, do these four terms belong in the same category? Well, hopefully you're thinking no. That's clear if you look at the revised version here. The revised version displays the relationship among the four terms more accurately than the original because only the first three terms appear in boldface. Those three are all terms for different models. The fourth term, claimed, in the revised version is in italics instead of boldface. That signals the writer wants to emphasize it rather than lump it into the same category as those other three terms. Good format often makes it possible for readers to get accurate information by skimming a document. And skimming is how people really use documents. The revised version of this passage allows the reader to see quickly that there are three models when scanning the document whereas the original version either misleads the reader into thinking there are four when scanning or requires more careful reading to see that there are only three. I've been referring to a report written by a technology consultant recommending a solution for a brewing company. Revising format in that report increases the efficiency with which readers get the writer's message. In the glossary, the writer has improved page layout, making better use of white space and typography, and using serif typeface for the body of text or prose. In other places, the writer has increased efficiency by using lists for items in series, making it easier for the managers of the brewing company to get the consultant's message is good business. A consultant who makes it difficult is less likely to keep the client happy. It's worth reminding you that most experienced students have difficulty accepting the importance of efficiency because it's so contrary to their experience in academic writing. Please remember that a teacher's job is to make sense out of what his or her students write. In contrast, professionals can either ignore inefficient documents or find ways to retaliate when writers waste their time and energy. Good organization ensures not only effectiveness, but also efficiency. Before this tutorial ends, let me say that there is no way to learn to write your own workplace documents effectively and efficiently without actually applying the ideas in this tutorial as you read and analyze new documents. Reading thoughtfully always precedes writing successfully.